For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. So 50 years ago, this month, Bangladesh or what was then East Pakistan was hurtling towards an inevitable armed clash between Indian military and the Pakistani army stationed in the eastern part of what was still Pakistan. That is the subject of this week's Simply Nitin. How it panned out, why India decided at this moment sometime in June that an armed intervention in East Pakistan was necessary is something that I am going to speak about in this episode of Simply Nitin. I am Nitin Gokhale. By now, all of you are familiar with the story of uh, Operation Searchlight and the crackdown by East Pakistan Army or the Pakistani Army in East Pakistan on 26th of March 1971 when Awami League leaders were arrested. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was arrested and taken to um, West Pakistan and of course a massacre ensued. In fact, it was a genocide, not only a small massacre. All that story is familiar to all of you who watch Strat News Global and of course Simply Nitin. Subsequently, when top leaders of Awami League fled to India and were received by the border security force in April 1971, they decided that they wanted to form a government, a provisional government in exile. So on 10th April 1971, the top leaders of the Awami League, except for Sheikh Mujibur Rahman who was under custody, formed a government in exile uh, and formally declared the government uh, on 17th or installed the government on 17th April in village uh, Bhaberpura in West Bengal. That was the beginning of what is called the independence struggle of Bangladesh. India of course was facing uh, other issues uh, with what was happening in East Pakistan. First of course the crackdown was uh, worrying because it forced many Bangladeshis to flee uh, what was then East Pakistan, many Bengalis, uh, I must say, to flee and come into Indian states of West Bengal, Tripura, Meghalaya, Assam, all those places. Now, it was a trickle initially. Maybe about 60,000 people came, then 80,000 people came. It eventually became almost 1 lakh people every day coming into the eastern part of India. Finally, by about June, which is this month that we are speaking in, India was hosting nearly 70 lakh Bengalis, both Hindus and Muslims, in these border states bordering East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. That number was to eventually go up to about 1 crore. 1 crore people living out in the open, makeshift camps, bad conditions, monsoons, uh, heavy monsoons creating uh, bad hygienic conditions or uh, conditions where people were dying of cholera, of malaria, of all the diseases that one can think of, lack of drinking water. Because after all, you can't host one crore people suddenly. The states didn't have the capacity. For instance, Tripura had a population of 15 lakh at that time. And 9 lakh people entered Tripura from East Pakistan. Now this was putting pressure on India as a whole and of course the states. Remember India was not a rich country uh, at that time. It was still uh, a poor country, a developing country, trying to come, come to grips with the challenges of feeding its own population, its own uh, people. And of course, there was to be droughts and famines in India at that point in time. So the burden was increasing every day. Then there were skirmishes that were happening on the border between what was uh, called the freedom fighters of uh, East Pakistan or Bengali freedom fighters, who were a ragtag army which needed to be now organized into a force that could be impactful, it could be uh, creating some problems for the Pakistanis. That is when Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, RN Kao of uh, the Research and Analysis Wing, PN Haksar who was uh, Indira Gandhi's Principal Secretary and the uh, Indian Army took matters in their own hand and decided that they will now create a Mukti Bahini. There was a Mukti Bhaini already, but a Mukti Bhaini which was professional, which was trained, 
to go and uh, carry out acts of sabotage, subterfuge and uh, demolition of uh, bridges, uh, maybe some assets, some uh, attacks on Pakistani uh, installations and forces and posts inside East Pakistan so that Pakistanis would be harassed and eventually when a war or a offensive would be launched by India, that date was not yet decided, remember? But it was inevitable by June 1971 that there will be an armed intervention by India because of the problems that I mentioned. Now, how does a nation get into that kind of an act of an offensive in a third country where India has uh, a stake all right but had no real uh, strength inside East Pakistan. So Mukti Bahini and Mujib Bahini were created. RNAW's uh, SFF, the Special Frontier Force headed by Major General S.S. Uban was entrusted with training almost 6,000 fighters uh, of Mukti Bahini into acts of sabotage, in uh, bomb making, in uh, intercepting Pakistani patrols, harassing them or even uh, recognizing the aircraft uh, of both the countries of India and Pakistan eventually which will come in handy. There were special operations planned uh, and that operation uh, was called Operation X where former Bengali uh, naval personnel in the Pakistani Navy uh, were trained to go to ports like Mongla, Chittagong and carry out acts of sabotage against ships both civilian ships and uh, in, uh, Pakistani naval ships coming into uh, East Pakistan so that uh, no help would come uh, to East Pakistan from West Pakistan. Remember, they are separated by this landmass of India, uh, the two wings of West and East Pakistan. So they were created and that uh, operation was called Operation X. It is a daring operation. This is, uh, there's a book written by my friend Sandeep Unnithan uh, about that operation uh, called Operation X. It's a fascinating account of how this was put together. Do read this, but there is much more to uh, Operation X than what I'm telling you. Then, of course, you have uh, my own book, uh, Aran Kao's book, uh, Aran Kao's biography rather, Gentleman Spy Master, which details the role of uh, Aran Kao, Shankaran Nair, S.S. Oban, who was a major general, and P.N. Banerjee, the most crucial man in the entire operation. P.N. Banerjee or Nath Babu, who was liaisoning with the political leadership of Awami League or uh, Bangladesh eventually the government that was created and knew exactly who stood where and what needed to be done. He was the points person uh, for the uh, Bangladeshi uh, government in exile with the government of India. He was the one who was giving crucial inputs. So all of these people put together realized that eventually India will have to launch an offensive into East Pakistan. But before that, they wanted to soften the uh, or sort of uh, weaken the East Pakistani establishment uh, led by Lieutenant General A.A.K. Niazi, who was the Eastern Army commander of Pakistan that time. And by doing that, what they were doing is basically creating obstacles for the Pakistani military stationed in East Pakistan. They were trying to cut, up, cut their aid off coming from West Pakistan. They were uh, demolishing bridges and installations and wireless stations and radio stations and ammunition dumps. So all this was done in a very well coordinated manner which was entrusted to the RNAW. And of course the man, RN Kao, who was uh, a confidant of uh, Mrs. Gandhi as well as P.N. Haksar. This is the uh, beginning of that planning of the Indian Army, the RNAW, the uh, political establishment and uh, the Prime Minister's office, that is Indira Gandhi's office, which created uh, this structure to uh, eventually launch the offensive on 3rd December 1971, of which you are also familiar because I have spoken about it a number of times, how India won that war in 13 days flat, uh, where all three forces played a big role. But this was the month when uh, the uh, realization dawned on the Indian government that this will be needed. So finally, one more thing was done. Perception management that one talks about in today's world, how uh, social media plays a big role, how it's a, a domain, the fifth domain of warfare, was also employed by India at that point in time. 
Indian government, RNAW, Indian Army, ensured that Western reporters, Western media reporters, were smuggled into East Pakistan, were facilitated uh, to show the atrocities of the East Pakistani army on the uh, civilian Bengalis, which created a big impact in the West and eventually allowed India to justify the armed intervention in December. Now, there, there are these famous reports by Sidney Shanberg in uh, March. Uh, then there is the biggest impact was uh, by uh, default, of course, of uh, Anthony Mascarenhas, who was a Karachi-based reporter who wrote a, a piece called uh, Genocide, single word, uh, which created the maximum impact and eventually uncovered the uh, scale and scope of the atrocities of the East Pakistani army on the Bengalis. That of course softened uh, the or sort of weakened the East Pakistani case or the Pakistani case when the world opinion went against them. And then India was eventually would launch this offensive into East Pakistan and of course win the war and create, help create uh, Bangladesh, which is now a vibrant country, one of the Asian tigers doing very well economically 50 years after it was created. In fact, it is giving a run uh, for money uh, for many of its neighbours, even including India, where their GDP growth has outpaced India in the past four or five years. That's the success story of Bangladesh in the 50 years since they were uh, declared independent country. But all that actually started from March, of course, when the genocide happened or the crackdown from East Pakistani army happened. And then by June, it was clear that the army had to, Indian military, had to go and intervene in East Pakistan to give Bengalis uh, the help they needed to earn their freedom from the rulers in West Pakistan. That's all I have in this episode of Simply Nitin, but you know where to reach us. Uh, please keep sending feedback. I will bring you these interesting anecdotes from history, sometimes from contemporary events, uh, sometimes linking history and contemporary events. But the idea is to try and inform the uh, subscribers and the audience uh, of Strat News Global of interesting events that shaped our history, not just uh, in the subcontinent, but across Asia. That's all I have, as I said, but do keep subscribing to our YouTube channel. And of course, our social media handles are there for you to follow and get uh, notification whenever you need to uh, actually watch our programs. Until the next time, it's goodbye.